Hey, hi guys, welcome back to the our tutorial on C++ programming language. Uh, in this video, we are going to talk about classes and objects. Before I start, first of all, I'm really sorry about the huge delay in uploading this video. As I had posted an update on uh, YouTube post that I was shifting my home and office, so I was really not able to find time to uh, create these videos so again I'm really sorry about that and uh, I'm pretty much settled now so I think I should be able to upload videos regularly now so anyways uh, without further ado let us continue with classes and objects so a class consists of data and functions so clubbed together they are called as data members so when I say the data data is nothing but the variables which are which we declare in the class and functions is something that are part of this class and can be used to perform certain actions and the functions can internally use the data that is a variable of the class. So as an example, if I say human is a class, then legs and hands can be my data and walking and running can be functions. So while walking and running, I can use legs. Similarly, another function can be eating and I might I could be using my hands while eating so class in a certain way is an entity now let us look at syntax of declaring a class so class is an keyword and a class name is followed by that so I can write class XYZ then a starting curly braces denotes that my class definition begins from this point and these are my data members till this ending curly braces then inside class definition we have access specifiers so i'll talk about it in the upcoming slides so after specifying the access specifier we have our list of variables here i'm calling them as data members so data members are declared using your standard data type and variable name pairs and you can have one or more data members like this and then you have your set of functions so a typical function declaration can be of this type so we have a written type it could be integer float and so on then you have your function name and then in the parenthesis you have your list of variables at the end of your class definition you have list of objects so there are two ways you can create objects of a class that is immediately writing it after the class declaration like we do in the case of structures and another way could be using your class name and then your object names so we'll talk about objects in more details in the next slides so for now just understand you can create objects at the end of your class name like this just adding them just before semicolon or you can write it anywhere in the program using class name and then object name list now let us talk about access specifiers so in c++ there are three access specifiers private public and protected so private is the default one as in when you don't write any access specifier private is considered by default when you specify access specifier as private in that case all the members which are part of your private access specifier scope then all those members can only be accessed within the class as in those cannot be directly called from outside of the class on the other hand when you have access specifier specified as public then those public members can be accessed from outside of the class and finally there is third type protected this is something that is used in inheritance so let us not get into that at the moment let us try to first understand how access specifier work with the help of this class diagram so this is my class and i am having there two access specifier one is private and other one is public so if you just closely look here what we have done is these public members are separated with private members okay so these public members however are accessible from outside the class okay and private members are not accessible if you just take over there's no access however you can access these private members using your public members 
okay so public functions have access to private data and private functions so public functions can not only access public data but they can also access private data i think it's pretty clear now how private and public members are accessed now let us try to understand uh, how access specifiers can be declared using these few examples so let us say i have a class name as my class so if you just notice here i have not written any access specifier for this first variable int data1 so by default this becomes a private access specifier so this becomes private data member and then because i have written public as the access specifier so all these members become public members of the class so there's another example where i have explicitly written private so technically both these examples are similar only thing is that in the first example private access specifier was not written so those c++ is providing you this additional uh, security or additional feature uh, having private as the default access specifier for your class members so it's generally a good practice to have explicitly write private as the access specifiers and defining your uh, members inside of private access specifications so in the another example if you just closely watch here so this is again private member and these are your public member because access specifier is public over here because there is no access specifier so this becomes private member this and this both are same because private is explicitly written over here and again these are your public members again this one and this one is again similar so all these three examples are similar but in the third example i have declared my public members first and then private members so the order does not matter over here so for c++ Uh, importance is of your access specifiers but generally again people usually declare their private members first uh, so they so you know while reading they get more importance and they usually write public or protected after the private members are declared but again that is something uh, individual's choice so technically it doesn't make any difference in the program so as earlier discussed that we have another uh, access specifier as protected so here's one example that you know how all the three can be combinedly used in one of the class declaration so i have private public protected all three access specifiers in this example and then after the scope resolution operator that is this colon i can have my variable and function declarations like this uh, another form could be wherein i have not written any access specifier over here so by default these two members are considered as private okay now for our current study we are just going to concentrate on private and public and we are going to touch upon protected as the access specifier when we are going to learn about inheritance so here is one example of how we can declare a class and create an object of a given class so i'm declaring a class as a vehicle and then i have public members inside this class as in total wheels and float mileage so these are two data members which are of type public that is those can be accessed from outside of the class inside of my main function i have created two objects v1 and v2 of type class vehicle and then i can access my data members with the help of a dot operator so i can write v1 that is object v1 dot total underscore wills is equal to 4 and after that i am initializing v1 dot mileage equal to 110 similarly i am doing the same thing for v2 with these two statements now interesting thing what we need to understand over here is that when this line is executed so v1 and v2 these two objects are created okay now because this two objects v1 and v2 are of type class vehicle so if you check this class vehicle has two 
data members okay so a separate copy for these two data members will be created for v1 and v2 okay so this is your total wheels for v1 and then mileage sorry for the bad writing and again total wheels for v2 and again mileage for v2 okay so using the dot operator i can use v1 dot total underscore wheels then again v1 dot mileage so when i'm writing v1 dot total wheels is equal to 4 so 4 will get stored over here and when i'm writing v1 dot mileage is equal to 110 110 will be get stored over here similarly in the next statements i'm writing v2 dot total wheels equal to 2 so we'll have 2 over here and then v2 dot mileage equal to 80 so 80 will be stored over here so for each copy of an object of class vehicle these two data members will be created like this so if i'm creating an object of class vehicle as x then again you know i'll have two more variables allocated for this object so this will be total wheels and then mileage and those can be accessed using the e dot operator like x dot total wheels and then x dot mileage so coming back to this program uh, after this we have c out statement so i have c out then v1 dot total wheels so that is four so four wheeler with v1 dot village that is 110 so 110 then we will have mileage and then end l so the first line will print four wheeler with 110 mileage similarly uh, we have v2 dot total wheels as two you can check it over here so after that this string will be printed wheeler with then we have v2 mileage that is 80 if you can check over here this value and then we have string mileage so the second line will print two wheeler with 80 mileage so if you can just compile this program you will get uh, this uh, output so four wheeler with 110 mileage and two wheeler with 80 mileage just notice that we have written zero at the end over here so we are just instructing compiler that main function is going to return an integer value so return zero so zero is nothing but an integer so technically here it is not really making any sense but in case you have any command line arguments or in case your program is executing at the command line so this return value might make a sense so it's not compulsory to write uh, uh, int always over here you can either write void or you can write float so so that really depends on your program requirements so now let's continue i am just going to speak about scope resolution operator before we continue with the uh, member functions while explaining them as a part of a class so next important topic is scope resolution operator scope resolution operator is nothing but two colons like this so scope resolution operator defines or explains scope of a variable or of a member to the compiler in this example i am using a variable x of type integer and i am initializing it to 10 uh, notice that this becomes a global variable because i am not declaring this variable inside of any function however inside of main function i am declaring the same variable x with the same type but with different value as 20 so for the compiler these two variables are different this x is a global copy and this x is local copy so though the variable name is same for compiler these are two different variables altogether now when i want to refer to this copy okay inside of main that can create ambiguity as well so when i am going to write 
see out x so for compiler it might create a confusion then because local variables are given the preference so when i'm going to write just simply x so compiler is going to refer to the local copy of variable x but when i'm using x along with scope resolution operator in that case compiler is going to refer to the global value of variable x so output of this program will be global x is equal to 10 and then on the next line because of the slash n it is going to write local x is equal to local x is equal to because i am referring to a x simply over here so it is going to refer the local value that is 20. so this is my output now scope resolution operator is more important or more relevant in our study when we are going to talk about declaring member functions so we're just going to check that topic in the next slide so when i have to define my class member functions so there are two ways to do it one is defining class members in line so that is when i have my class x as an example over here so i am using public as the access specifier and foo and foo is the function name so if you just check over here so immediately after so this is my function definition of the function foo so i'm just printing over here a hello message in this case i am defining the function inline that is i'm defining those member function inside of my class definition so this is my class definition so you can have n number of member functions uh, declared like this uh, in line in your class definition however it again it's not a standard practice reason being in case you have let's say hundreds of different member functions in that case your class definition can be very huge and it might not be good idea because it might be difficult to read your class definition quickly so usually what good programmers do is that they declare their data members and data functions inside of class and then they define the member functions using the scope resolution operator that is something that we are going to check in the next slide but however continuing with this program so after my class definition is done inside of main i have created object a of class x and then I am accessing my member functions using a dot foo. So this line is going to print this message and it is just going to return zero over here. So output of this program is nothing but this string. What we wanted to understand is how member functions can be defined in line. Now in the next slide, we are going to check how we can define class member functions using scope resolution operator, which is a cleaner way to define your member functions. So I'm taking the same example. So I'm having my class X, then I have public declaration of function foo. So it is not going to return anything. So I have written type as void. Now notice there is a semicolon. So this is nothing but the function declaration of a function foo okay now in order to define that function what i'm going to do is i'm going to write a written type of that function because here it was void so this is the written type and then i'm going to use a scope resolution operator that is dot dot and i'm going to define scope of this function to class x so to compile that i'm going to tell that this function is part of my class x so only thing that is changing is x colon colon okay that is x scope resolution operator and then i have uh, my standard definition so my code inside of this parenthesis and then inside of main i am creating one object a of type class x then i'm just going to call it normally using the dot operator that is a dot foo and then there's a written zero at the end so what you need to understand over here is that your program could have another class let's say class y and it could have a same function name let's say public then void foo parenthesis and semicolon 
so because now you have two different classes but then there is a function name which is identical in that case when you are required to define those functions you have two choices one is you can have inline function definition in both the classes but we know that this is not a cleaner way to do so you can do it alternatively using the scope resolution operator so similarly to this code you can have your void then because you are writing the function definition for class y so you are going to write the class name then scope resolution operator then after that your function name and then you can write your code inside the parenthesis now let us check how we can parameterize member functions or how we can send parameters to the member functions so let us try to understand that with help of this example i am defining a class named maths and then i have public data members variable a and b of type integer and then i'm going to use a function add which is going to return me one integer value and it is going to take two values as parameters int a and b now another point i want to make here is because this is just a function declaration variable names are not required over here okay you can just simply write int comma int because to the compiler you are just going to tell that i am creating one member function called as add it is going to return me a value of type integer and i am going to supply two values both of type integer to it so int comma int but here just i am writing this variable names also just to simplify the understanding and then with the help of a scope resolution operator i am defining my member function so int my class name maths colon colon function name and then here in the definition i am going to write this variable names so inside of my function definition i am writing int c creating another variable and adding these two variables so a plus b storing that value into variable c and i am going to return that value so return c so this completes my function definition now inside of main function i am creating one object m1 of class maths so when m1 is created okay it is going to have these two data members okay so inside of m1 i'm going to have value a and b which are public hence those are accessible directly so i'm writing m1 dot a is equal to 10 and m1 dot b equal to 20 so value 10 and 20 will be stored to the memory allocated for the object m1 and after that we have on c out statement where i'm just writing addition of m1 dot a that is 10 and m2 dot b which is 20 then is then i'm writing m1 dot a m1 dot b so i'm supplying two values that is 10 and 20 and it is going to return me addition of these two numbers so addition that is 30 will be replaced over here okay so output of this program would be addition of 10 and 20 is 30 now in the next topic i'm going to touch upon this topic that is inline returns so so in case you have seen in the previous example we had created this variable int c equal to a plus b and then i was returning value of c so instead of doing that what we can do is we can write the addition in line and because these are two integers so addition of two integer is going to give me integer only so i'm just going to return it in line that is a plus b so what i'm doing over here is i am not creating one additional variable just to perform an addition operation so these are inline returns so you can have any kind of formula over here you can use parenthesis or or in fact you can have another function call also over here so it depends on your programming requirements but inline return is something really useful and it reduces the amount of variables that you might require in your code now let us talk about private member functions we have seen that we are able to access uh, public member functions directly from the other members but how we can access or perform operations on your private member functions especially uh, data members and uh, your member functions so let us try to understand that with the example of this class so i'm having this class match then i'm having this private members 
okay one is variable c of type integer and then i have a add function which is going to perform addition on two integers again if you notice a and b is explicitly written over here because this is my inline function definition so variable name will be required over here and then int a comma int b will be added into variable c okay so addition of the supplied variables will be stored into private data member c okay now because c is a private data member it cannot be directly accessed so what we are doing now is we are creating another member function show which is just going to take two values just for the display purpose and it is going to use variable c as well inside the code okay so this is another inline function definition of function show so what i'm doing here i'm calling add function directly and i'm supplying values to it now show function is able to make this call because all the public member functions have access to the private member functions of the same class hence this call is valid over here however the same code cannot be written directly in the main functions or any other functions as well okay so inside of main function now let us see what is happening so i have my class name m1 so i'm creating one object m1 so m1 is going to have variable c which is a private then it is going to have two more variables a and b so a and b so notice that c is the private data member and a and b are public data members now because a and b are public data members so i can directly write m1 dot a and m1 dot b however i cannot write m1 dot c because c is not accessible from outside of the class okay so in order to access variable c what most i can do is i can call m1 dot show again why show we are able to call from here is because show is of type public if you can see over here it is public member function i cannot write m1 dot add directly here because add is the private member function so what is going to happen here is i am passing m1 dot a and m1 dot b that is 10 and 20 so these variables will go here so 10 and 20 will be passed here then i am writing add 10 and 20 so call will be transferred to here and then addition will be performed here value will be updated as m1 dot c equal to 30 so m1 dot c will become 30 so this c becomes 30 now and then one execution of this function is completed after that we are writing compiler will come back to here and then it will print this line so addition of variable a and variable b is c so it is nothing but addition of a that is 10 and b which is 20 is c that is 30 another important thing to notice over here is i'm just writing a b c directly i don't need to write my object name over here okay because you might have multiple objects like m1 and m2 so whenever m2 dot show is being called that time this a and b are going to refer to the values of object m2 okay so this is just important point i wanted to make over here so object name you cannot write inside of your class definitions uh, we're just going to cover this last topic on arrays within class so i'm having this class name array demo and then i'm having one integer array of size 6 i'm calling this integer array as a so notice that this is my private member now and using public as the access specifier i am having two member functions one is get elements and other one is show so get elements is nothing uh, but it is going to help me uh, accept six values from from the user so inside of a for loop i am writing c in 
and this for loop is starting from 0 it will go till 6 so for all the values 0 1 2 3 4 and 5 it is going to store integer value that user is going to supply and then inside of function show i'm just going to reprint those values so i have a similar for loop and i'm just going to print those values for all the array elements using c out okay so inside this loop loop will start from a of 0 and it will go till a of 5 so inside of this loop it is going to c out or it is going to print values from a0 to a5 so after the class definition i'm having my function min and then i'm creating object obj of type class array demo now once this is done i am calling object dot get elements first so with the help of this line or this function call i am going to execute this code or this function and it is going to store values for object obj dot a0 to a certain value then a1 to a certain value and so on so all the array elements can be accessed like this so obj dot a0 obj dot a1 obj dot a2 and so on till obj dot a of 5 so all the values will be stored at these memory locations and similarly with the help of object dot show i can print those values okay notice that i have access to the private array a so i'm just directly writing here so once variables are accepted using this value using this line then i'm just going to reprint those values using my another function object dot show and with the written zero my program will end so what i suggest now is just play around with the example that we have shown in this video you can download the samples code from our website so you can have quick access to the code so i'll see you in the next video when we are going to touch upon few more operators and few more concepts on object oriented programming so that is all for this session if you have liked this video i'll request you to share this video with your friends family and your colleagues uh, you can share it on whatsapp and your facebook accounts in case you are not subscribed to our channel code god you can definitely do that you can also hit the notification icon so you get quick notification whenever we upload a new video we also have an instagram page now so you can follow us there so you can always get quick updates thank you so much guys for watching this video i will see you in the next video happy coding thanks mm -hmm.